a what I'm calling in real America. Now the good news is, the good news is this doesn't happen often. The good news is, I kind of I have a vision, I have a passion, I have a like I know what I want to paint, and I just set out today. Uh, jumped in the car. Let me. I'm gonna keep talking while I get another brush. Uh, jumped in the car and headed out in the country from where we live. I'm about only five miles, maybe six miles, maybe seven. And I, I'm I'm looking for real America. Working, working class, working men, working stuff. And uh, I took several photographs on the way here and then took pictures of this. Decided, well, you know, I can keep driving for hours. I can keep driving for hours looking for the perfect thing. But there was just enough here that said, wait a minute, why don't I just stop, just stop here? Just stop here and let's start painting. So I want to see if I can turn this very mediocre, if you will, very ordinary scene into an extraordinary painting. For those of you that watch me often, what I just did is absolutely no surprise to you. To those of you who maybe are joining me for the first time, you're going, what the heck? <laughs> right. So the scene that I'm painting is basically, let me get out of the way, is that right there. And that's how I'm starting it. I have some long handled brushes in the car. But this is such a small painting. Let's just see if I can get away with just the, these short-handled things. Um, I feel like there's a lot of the elements here that I'm looking at are very good. Now, let me think. What do, what do I want? Do I want the horizon high or horizon low? High, low. Oh, you're not seeing me, sorry. Okay, so high, low. High, low. I want the horizon low, so so I'm going to move this. Here's the peak of the roof. This shape of building, shape of barn, I'm taking that most of you know is just absolutely ubiquitous in rural America, and and it's that it it is that ubiquitousness <laughs> that I'm looking for. I'm, I'm not. I'm not looking for abandoned houses and haunted houses. If you know what I mean. What a child would call a haunted house. That's not what I'm after today. I, I'm. I'm after working America, real America. For some reason, it just that that concept just resonates with me these days. Um, it's mildly patriotic, sort of along the lines of. You know, country country music kind of patriotism, kind of here's to the working man kind of stuff, so on. Here's to the middle class and stuff like that. But I don't want it to be in your face, in your face patriotic or in your face anything. Um, it just just gives me a good starting point. And uh, I've been I've this been growing in me for uh, several weeks now. It it it's it. Uh, the concept sprang to my mind several weeks ago. I thought, hey, how about a series of paintings just called Real America? And for some reason, it doesn't need to, it, that, that title does not at all need to resonate with you guys. It just needs to resonate with me uh, in order to paint, what I, I, that is to say. Now, if I want to sell stuff, the, the painting needs to resonate. But um, the, the theme is just, is just for me, a getting started. It's just a jumping off point. That's all it is. So we'll see. Um, I've got a couple shows coming up this summer. Well, one for sure, maybe two. That's only because I'm not a very good administrator that I haven't followed up on some, some things that conversations that I've had in the last couple months. Anyway, I have definitely have one show coming up in Wilson, North Carolina. And uh, the theme of Real America, as if you know anything about North Carolina, then you know that Wilson would be a, a great place to have, have a show called 
real America because that's the kind of place it is, small town America. Not exactly a fine arts mecca, if you know what I mean. Not exactly. Although it's, it's got a pretty interesting story connected as far as arts and Wilson go. Um, home of the Whirligigs, home of the Whirligig Festival, home of, and all of a sudden the man's name is escaping me, it'll come back to me in a minute. Believe it or not, a man. Um, oh, good grief. Okay, his, his name will come to me in a minute. Since I've gone that far, I'll give you, I'll give you the, some of the story. So, uh, his name's right on the tip of my tongue. Can't get it out. But anyway, he, uh, veteran, World War II veteran, came home from his stint in the military and just worked basically as a country boy, farmer, whatever. And um, in his retirement, starting at age 60 or 65, I forget what the number was, in his retirement, he started tinkering in his barn out back. And he started building whirligig. Well, whirligig is just thing that's sticking the ground and, it's a, and it catches the wind and spins, right? Uh, okay, I got a problem here. Either the, the truck is too small, <laughs> the wheels need to come down to here. There we go. Um, Simpson. Um, Hollis Simpson. There we go. H O L L I S. Hollis Simpson started. This is such. I, I mean, I hope somebody makes a movie of his life someday, at least a documentary. Yeah, although that's it's already documentary. It's already been done. Hollis Simpson, at age 60, started tinkering in his barn or garage using the skills he had used his whole life of, of an engineer, a, a mechanical, physical, building stuff engineer. And uh, he started building these whirly gigs, a thing that spins, only a little bit bigger than this. <laughs> Some of them are 40, 50 feet tall, weigh tons, and are all made out of scrap material. Fascinating story. Fascinating. Well, Vollis, did I say Vollis, V-O-L-L-I-S, Vollis Simpson, um, went on to become world, his, his whirly goops made him world famous and frankly put Wilson on the map. Uh, there's a whirly gig festival that takes place there every November and I've been a part of that for the last 12 years. And... Uh, there's now a multi-million dollar whirligig park right in the middle of downtown Wilson. Uh, two, three, four, five acres, I don't know, big, big three, four city blocks. Beautiful, beautiful state-of-the-art lighting stadium and dozens of Vala Simpsons whirligigs. Um, what excites me about that is Vala Simpson, ordinary guy, Ordinary working American um, shifted the culture of an entire town. Tinkering in his garage. Um, I'm looking for a spray bottle, and I'm afraid I don't have one. That's an oversight. I need to. I really need to fix. So no spray bottle. Um, let me continue painting then. Let's do some blue sky. Blue sky, smiling at me. Nothing but blue sky. Do I see? <laughs> I said, started singing that yesterday too, didn't I? Or the day before. <laughs> Sorry. Promise not to make a habit of it. quick huh <laughs> yeah the, the initial stages of my painting process are de deceptively uh, fast <laughs> I wish the whole process went this went this fast alas it, it, it doesn't 
Okay, so I am plein air painting today. That means I have to think about light, I, especially early on, which is now. This is early on, just getting started. And I have to make up my mind. Here's, here's the decisions I have. Basically, do I like the lighting the way it is right now? And by that, I actually mean the way it was five minutes ago when the sun was hitting this building. Do I like the lighting the, the way it is essentially right now? Or do I think the lighting is going to be considerably better in one, two, three hours? If I do, then I, I try to guess what the lighting is going to be like in one, two, or three hours. And I start painting in that direction. If I'm still out here in one, two, or three hours, then I, I get to find out at that point how close or how accurate my guesses were. And then I possibly modify my, my painting to match the reality. So those are the, the two main options. Is uh, either I like the, the lighting the way it is right now. And I, I've already taken a picture of it. Or do I uh, think it's going to look better in a little while. And I guesstimate and start painting in that direction to the best of my guessing. And my, I think I like the paint. I think I like, this is a little bit unusual for me. But I think I like the, uh, the light the way it is right now. It's also a little bit unusual because the light is actually real high in the sky. And... Most of the time, I like uh, golden hour, late, late in the day uh, painting, sunrise or sunset, low painting. In case you're wondering, yes, I, I paint me myself. I paint a whole lot more sunsets than I do sunrises. That's my circadian rhythm, and I'm sticking with it. I, I, I've given up fighting against it in spite of what all you morning people keep trying to tell me. It just doesn't work. My mom was a bona fide card-carrying morning person. Most of her children were not. <laughs> of course, so we went through most of our lives with our mom thinking we were lazy. Well, my dad was also not a morning person. So I contend we got it from him. And uh, some of the subcultures that I've grown, grown up with over the years, uh, what's the word, cater to, encourage, uh, um, reward, morning, being a morning person. Even some of the, I'll say, the, the Christian subculture that I grew up in, the more godly you were, the earlier you got up. <laughs> now, don't think that it's just a weird Christ Christian thing. That's also, that, that myth is also shot through like the uh, uh, Harvard Business School, uh, medical schools. Do you know we kill our doctors? Doctors have a, have a terribly high death rate, a hair, terribly short lifespan on average, way shorter than average. Because starting way back in medical school, they start training doctors to be macho, little sleep, up early in the morning, wackos, which is just insane. Anyway, so I've come to peace. I'm poor. I, I, I am, frankly, I'm the most productive person I know. Now, I'm sure there's some people that are more productive, but I'll give them a run for their money. And... Uh, and I've done all that as a nocturnal <laughs> creature. <laughs> so anyway, how did I get on that subject? <laughs> oh yeah, I, so I've done a lot more evening paintings than, than morning. A lot more sunsets than sunrises. And if you're a sunrise person, you go for it, man. You just go for it. Although I will say, there does seem to be a slight correlation between creativity... Cre <laughs> did I say that right? <laughs> creativity and um, a late in the day circadian rhythm. M many creative creatives, they're not just lazy SOBs, they're actually creative and they actually do function better. Uh, now, there's not an awful like, lot I can do right here, so this is a good place for a little break. 
I need to wait for this white stuff to dry. I'm gonna, in, in a minute, I'm gonna run a, a damp brush through that white to, to smear it out and speed up the drying and also to create interesting marks. But I'll bring you back before I do that, I think. So a little break, thank uh, Boy, this, this stuff is drying pretty quickly. Hi, <laughs> Renee, thank you. Uh, okay, I wanna demonstrate this for you. This is big, broad brush, just slightly damp. It's actually, this stuff is a little drier than I'd expected. And I don't know if you can see what just, I think you can see like, like that streak right there and that right there. Okay, so I have that, that, this action that I just did, that I'm done now, has served two functions. It has accomplished two things. Number one, it is spread out the fat parts of the acrylic paint, the part that takes a long time to dry. And I would have, I would have had to take another five or ten minutes to wait for those piles of paint to dry. And I don't want to take five or ten minutes standing around. This I've got work to do, right? So that's one thing it has accomplished. The other thing it has accomplished, although in this case to a minimal degree, I would have liked it to have been a little wetter, it creates interesting energy strokes that have nothing to do with similitude, nothing to do with realism. They're just strokes of energy. Now, let me say, so, and you, I tried to tell my class, most recent class, I tried to demonstrate this for them, and many of the students I still found totally not getting it. Okay, so let me demonstrate, again, without touching the canvas. Here's the kind of action that you have to exercise for this to work. Vroom! And I said, and what I found, well, for, certainly, now none of them did this, but this is why. No, 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 no brushy, brushy, brushy. In fact, get brushy, brushy, brushy completely out of your system. For most of you, you need to understand that brushy, brushy, when you paint that way, you are painting crap. Do not brushy, brushy. Okay? There's another name for that. It's called the ergonomic stroke. See, why is my hand moving in this manner? Why is my hand moving that way? Is it because I'm thinking like an artist? Not a bit of it. It's moving this way because that's the way my muscles and skeletal structure are designed to work. Here's one way to put it. Anything that is easy for your body to do in quick, rapid succession is a terrible way to paint. You want your brain to be telling your hand how to move. You don't want your hand telling your brain how to move. This makes ugly marks, okay? Okay, but what I did find was that instead of going like this or like this, some of my students went, first of all, horizontal, not so good. Boring marks if you're painting them. Serene, serene, serene. Did I say serene enough times? Sunset, maybe. Otherwise, energy marks, diagonal. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's get on now with the business of painting. Enough of the ranching and raving. <laughs> Let's warm this up now with some orange and some yellow. Just, just warm up the whole thing. And when I say the whole thing, you'll you'll notice that I don't mean I that I literally covered the whole canvas. That would be a waste of energy. To cover the entire canvas would 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 be a waste. It just covers the whole thing with a color. Instead, cover part of it so you get strokes, drips, runs, okay, interest. Um, you want to create a lot of chaos. And I'm going to do some drawing with some smaller brushes. You want to create a lot of, vi lot of visual chaos on your canvas right up until the final, final stage layer phase, which I now call the final edit could also be called light opaque highlights but here lately the last several weeks I've been calling it the final edit up until the final edit you want to create energy on your canvas energy is more important than similitude similitude is dreadfully important I want my paintings to be accurate but Energy is even more important than accuracy. Whew. That's hard for a student to learn. That is so hard. What do you mean? Can I be messy? Yes, you can be messy. Can I be inaccurate? No, you cannot be inaccurate. <laughs> I know I'm very yelly today, aren't I? Well, I'm way out here in the country all by myself. <laughs> 
whatever you do, don't let them loose out in the country. <laughs> he goes nuts. <laughs> oh. So drawing, drawing, drawing here. Um, for the last seven years, I think at least, I've been on a, on a very, very conscious quest. I, I mention this periodically, so if you watch me often, you've heard this before, so prepare to be repeated. I've been on a very conscious quest for my paintings to be more messy and more accurate both. More accurate and more messy. When I look around at the painting that the painters that I admire most, the painters that I drool over, uh, they are amazingly good drawers. And their paintings are amazingly messy. Those two things. They, they seem like opposites in a sense they are. But we want to squeeze these, squeeze these two opposites together. Messy and realistic. I am far from the only one on such a quest. All the best painters... Uh, Okay, here we go again. What about my dear friends who paint hyper hyperrealism? Okay, all except for them. <laughs> all of the best painters I know paint accurate and messy. I name their names often. I'm not going to do it. Um, I came across a new one just before I left the house today. Mark Hansen. I think it's M-A-R-C. Mark Hansen. Uh... Elizabeth Polly, P O L L I E. Elizabeth Polly. I met her in person at Oil Painters of America a couple years ago, but of course I like dropping the name. <laughs> Goes without saying. Anyway, Elizabeth Polly, look her up. In fact, her, her painting a couple years ago that won an award at OPA. Really, really, her painting. Elizabeth, if you ever hear this, I've never said it. It's just been stuck in the recesses of my mind. Your painting was one of those that impacted me the most in this regard. It's like, oh my goodness. Most good painters, like the people at OPA, Old Painters America, most good painters are messier than I am. And she won a, an award that year, a couple years ago, for... A beautiful painting of two horses bridled in, in, in uh, livery and pulling up, you know, as if to pull a carriage or something. But a cl just a close-up of their heads. And it won an award. And it was so messy that at several points of the painting, you couldn't tell, does this ear belong to this horse or that horse? Does this mouth belong to this horse or that horse? Does this rein belong to this horse or that horse? You couldn't tell, but it was a gorgeous painting deserved every bit of winning uh, what it did. And, uh, and her painting was one of those that really helped break through some fog in my brain. I went, wow, good painters are even messier than I am. Now, I already been, I'd already been on this messy trajectory goal for, for some time. This was two years ago, and I think I've been on this more accurate, more messy trajectory for at least seven that it's a conscious, conscious stated thing in my mind. More messy and more accurate. And I, I part of me hopes you're mildly confused by that. Uh, and part of me hopes you keep on chewing on it till you figure it out. Um, everything I do as in my painting, when I'm doing a painting painting, <laughs> not an illustration, not a picture like I did the other, yesterday as a demo. Everything that I do... Uh, is is aiming in that direction more messy and more accurate everything that I do is aiming in that direction why do I paint for two hands it helps me be more messy why do I do layers of crazy acrylics more messy why do I draw with pencils and brushes more accurate Everything I do is aimed in this direction. More accurate and more messy. 
I think I've said that enough times, don't you? <laughs> Can I quit now? Hey, just for fun, let me give you a, a 360 of where I'm at. So I'm painting this. I'm standing in the yard of an abandoned house. Not fully abandoned, but nobody's living in it. Evidently. There's my work van. I'm across the street from, again, one of these. I, I actually took a picture. I could turn that into a painting, too. One of those ubiquitous one-stop shops out in the country, you know, buy your beer, buy your... But it's just beautiful cedar tree. Part of the reason I decided to stop here and paint is I could stand under the shade of this tree. So that's where I'm at today. Okay. Now you feel like you know where I'm at, don't you? My mom, the English major, would would have a cow at the where I'm at thing. <laughs> at least I'm smart enough to know when I'm using bad grammar. <laughs> I use it anyway, but I know that I'm using it. <laughs> And I'm eternally grateful to my mom for that gift. Oh, oh, a little bit of sun now coming through the tree and hitting my canvas. That is not a good thing. You really can't paint very well. Very difficult to paint with sun on your canvas. I'm just going to hope that's going to move on shortly. I do have an umbrella in my car that I can go and get. Okay, this is now my last layer of acrylic, which is uh, white. Second layer of white. And then I move on to oils. I begin to hint at the the boards in this building, even in the acrylic stage. Hey, are, we, are we zoomed in all the way? Almost, almost. Do you see this orange? I, I'm not even sure where that came from. That's just a good example. Again, I'm just, I'm just telling you why I like painting in my technique. There are many techniques that work. This is, just happens to be the one that I've been stuck on for the last 15 years. And anytime I think about abandoning it, I go, nah. I don't think so. Oh, wait. I'm painting over uh, one of my pink, um, whatever, canister things. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Big pink tank on the back of that truck. It might be a sewer, uh, a septic tank truck. <laughs> that would be funny. That would be appropriate for painting real America. Septic tank pump. I'm not sure that's what it is, but now that I think about it, it might be. <laughs> that would be okay. I realized up here that I, I actually made that gable steeper than it actually is, actually wider than this. And I mentioned that partly because I've discovered that I do that so often that it's almost safe to say I always do it. And, and I have wondered often if that's just a big, bad drawing mistake, error, which in a sense it is, because I don't really do it on purpose. Or is, is it... Um, am I doing that intuitively because it makes it a more interesting shape? And the answer to the second question is yes. Um, I have very, very carefully thought about it. And I've discovered that I do a lot of architecture, as you know. And or if you don't know, go to my website, look at my paintings. Lots, Most of my paintings are like this, of architecture. Very often they are paintings of 
cityscapes, very often, you know, old houses and so forth, like, like Victorian, beautiful old houses. Um, and I tend to squeeze them all this way. And yeah, it might be a mistake, but it's also conveniently um, makes the shape slightly more interesting than they would be otherwise. So here I've done it again. I gave it a fleeting thought several minutes ago when I was drawing that the first time. In fact, I had it drawn even steeper than that originally, and then I, I flattened it out a little bit, but not enough. And I, I think that's okay. There, I think it is true as an artist. I think that there are some things that you do intuitively because it actually makes a better painting. You have to watch out for that. That can be an excuse for sloppy drawing. And as, as you know, I'm interested in being more accurate. But I do think very often with when it comes to buildings that um, if they're accordionated, <laughs> compressed, condensed a little bit, that they're slightly more interesting. I don't know, just a theory, half-baked theory, I will admit, but one I invite you to think about with me. Hey, I don't know how many of you were with me earlier this week. Um, yesterday, uh, which was Wednesday, Tuesday night and Wednesday, Daily Art Adventure 391 and 392, I did uh, a very fun exercise. I did two little paintings uh, from the same reference photo. In fact, the, 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 the farm in, the, in that painting is only about three miles down the road to my left as I'm standing, or straight down the direction you're looking. Right now, the, that that building, that that farm that I painted. So I'm, I'm coming back to some old haunts today. Um, I was doing an, and if you if you're interested, if you're an artist, I, if you're a student, I implore you go back and watch that. Um, in it, I address the question of picture versus painting. Picture versus painting. And uh, I was going to say, ironically, so I, I think I was pretty happy with the outcome. In my opinion, the, the painting was better than the picture. Though I went downstairs yesterday afternoon to where my wife was in the kitchen. She does not live in the kitchen, by the way, but she's a pretty darn good cook. And... Um, she liked the wrong one. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with... And I certainly didn't try to change your mind. I said, yep, that's okay. <laughs> and, and then I've had a couple of viewers say, really, Dan, I can't see the difference. I suspect that the viewers who say that are not artists. So, however, um, I suspect that they, sim they simply truly cannot really see the difference. And it's because they're not highly visually and that's all right as artists you know we don't theoretically I, I think we shouldn't be I think we should not be painting for other artists unless it's other well how's who's to say um, no I don't, I don't think we should be painting for other artists both financially that's not who's gonna buy our paintings and other artists have their worlds full of art it's the non artists that need our art in their world anyway um, Grass, grass, grass. It's gotten, uh, a, it seems to me, a good deal cloudier out here since since I first arrived. Um, I did take a picture, I'm happy to say, happy, relieved. I took a, a good, decent picture of this uh, view. 
before I started painting, so if I need to, I can go back and reference that uh, photograph. Thank you! <laughs> I just got a nice vote of confidence from across the road. That is awesome! That's pretty cool that she can see enough to um, manage an opinion from that distance. So that's nice. Okay, I think I'm done with the acrylics. Let me take a little break. I'm going to clean up, pack up all my acrylics, get my oil paints out. And uh, I should be back in a few minutes. Thanks, you guys, so much for watching. Fun, huh? Again, I wish the whole painting process went as quickly as the first... You know, whatever those stages are. It's going to slow down here in a bit. Okay. Hello, welcome back. Hey, Karen, thanks for joining. I probably lost you by now. Okay, time for glazing. Let's start going. I use, as you probably know, liquid oil glaze, liquid gel. That's a pile of it right there. And I've got oxide red. Don't be confused by the name if you're not an artist. It's not red, it's brown. It's kind of an orange rust brown. That's the oxide rust. <laughs> Got it? Pretty typical. Not, not always, but very, very often. More often than any other color. I, I start my oil glaze with an oxide red. I just like, I like the color. I like the way it warms up the whole canvas. Gives it kind of a classy, old world feel. Now, it's not going to stay this color. This is just my first layer of glaze. And again, some, uh, forgive me, some students seem to have a hard time understanding the concept of glaze often. Glaze, is, you could, it's like laying a piece of transparent glass or cellophane up over your painting. Perfectly clear. If it's, if it's, hiding uh, earlier uh, imagery, it, earlier work, then it's not a glaze. That's a coat of paint. It has to be perfectly, can be any colors in the world, even gray. But the key issue is that it's transparent. Okay, that's plenty warm. <laughs> now, yeah, I'm going to Uh, wipe off these brushes a little bit. A little box of Kleenex down here on the ground with my feet. Not ideal by any means. I'm going to save, save these rags for later. Okay, now, ultramarine. Again, pretty typical for me. This color combination is what I use the most, but it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just what I, I my most frequent go to. So ultramarine, which is a uh, purple-ish blue, a cool blue. In order for that to make sense, you need to understand the concept of warm and cool. Go to one of my YouTube videos where I discuss warm and cool. I think you could look it up by that name. And now a little bit of phthalo blue, which is a warm blue. We'll say that in order for this terminology to make sense, you need to have a, a, a good read, a good bead on what warm and cool means. Some of you have learned that yellow is warm, and I, I hate to mess with your worldview, but you learned wrong. If you were told that yellow is warm, yellow is warm-ish, some of you were told that red is warm. I hate to bust your bubble. But you were told wrong. Some of you were told that orange is warm. Ah, now we're getting close. Now we're getting close. Orange is warm. It's a combination. Whoops, I forgot to do something. I forgot to just dump out my water. Hang on, bear with me for just a minute. I need, I need some trypanoid in this bucket. So let's water the grass. <laughs> and, uh, Here's a little trick. 
this, this is my Soltec easel on my body used. I'm glad I got it. It's worked very well for me. Uh, I've never had the, the infamous leg collapse. It's never happened to me yet. But uh, this bucket right here is I carry with me I, everywhere. I, this is my tin bucket in which I put water, if I'm using water, or in which I put my terpenoid can, if I'm using terpenoid or camsol or whatever. Uh, good system. A bucket in a bucket. I don't know why everybody doesn't do that. And by the way, uh, just again, I know I'm always picking on students, but <laughs> I'm here to help. Almost all students are notorious for using tiny little buckets, a little bit of water, a little bit of gam a little bit, no, 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 no. If you, a little bit of paint, and that's why part of what keeps them from becoming good paint, they don't put enough paint, they don't have big enough buckets. You waste a lot of money when you use itty bitty little buckets. The contract, the opposite of what, what most of, most of them are thinking. They're trying to save money so they use itty bitty little buckets. Okay, now. Uh, another quick view at the scene over there. Yeah, not bad. In fact, he thinks I should take a picture of that right now. Whoops, and I forgot my backup. My backup. Rats. Okay. So I can't take a picture right now because you guys are on it. So, but I'm I'm liking the liking that lighting. The way it is right now. Okay, now let's do some ragging. The cab of this truck is is huge. That's going to be the brightest spot on the whole painting. Followed closely by the face of this barn, of course. Followed not for not for lightness, but for intensity by those two pink uh, whatever those are. On the back of the uh, truck. Once again, I got some sun shining on my canvas, which makes it quite difficult to see what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Another vote of confidence by uh, from a country drive drive by. Hmm. See, <laughs> that looks like a light spot with that sun up there. So, again, I think I'm just going to try to wait wait it out. I'm standing under a tree. I'm hoping that will get that that uh, bit of light will, will pass on quickly. Okay, so the next step usually in my process is I either draw either with pencils or with brushes. And I don't know why, very intuitive, I can't even pinpoint why. But for some reason today, I'm in the mood here to do pencil things. And if you don't follow me normally, then 
let me give this little speech to you. You regular sir, you'll have to suffer through this <laughs> little speech one more time. I use pencils, a black a jumbo jet, jumbo jet black pencils made by Jerry's Artorama. It is very unconventional to use pencils in an oil painting. You got that? Very first of all, so you know I'm breaking the rules. If you, if you should be saying, "Huh, I didn't know you could use pencils in an oil painting," that would be the proper response. That is correct. No, traditionally you cannot. Uh, now, traditional oil painters, years in past years, and I'm sure many of them still do it. Um, you know, start by using a, a charcoal pencil, do a charcoal sketch underneath on their bare canvas to get started. This is not that. Those people who use charcoal to do a sketch, they're using it just to do a sketch. They, they do not expect any of the uh, charcoal to be visible in the final composition, okay? I, on the other hand, I don't need to do this. The drawing is already more than enough done that I wouldn't need to come in with pencils. I'm doing it because I like the juxtaposition. I like how it looks when these scratchy pencil lines are on top of, next to, underneath the smooshy brush lines. So it's, I do, I'm doing it for, es, for abstract aesthetic reasons, not for drawing reasons. Now, having said that, of course, it is, uh, coincidentally, it is, the, that is to say, the pencils do make drawing a little bit easier. They, they do aid in similitude. They do make the capturing the image accurately a little bit easier. So it's both and. But the real reason I'm using it is not because I need to draw, okay? Um, it's because I like the look. And uh, at the end of this pencil stage, my, my painting will be entirely too liney. It will be distinctly have too much pencil lines in it. Are you with me? You catching me? It will have too much pencil lines. It'll look and could be kind of irritating to the viewers. Like, ooh, what are all those lines doing there? Okay, but don't worry because um, I have three, four or five more layers, stages, phases to go yet, during the course of which much of this pencil stuff will be covered up. Okay? How much? Don't know. It's not, not my job at this point to, to, uh, it, it, to edit and compose at the same time. Hey, that's a good way to put it. Same thing I think applies to writing, uh, journalism or creative writing, writing the English language. Don't try to, you don't, forgive me for talking about writing, but you don't try to compose and edit on the same pass. You compose at one pass and then you edit later. You don't do both at the same time or you just get yourself tied in knots. You get yourself paralyzed. Ooh, there's some power lines back there. I didn't even notice till right now. And I'm going to put a telephone pole back there. Glad I noticed. The pole is not there, the, the lines are. Definitely gives it an air of country living to have that, uh, those power lines going through the sky like that. I often add them where they don't exist. And when I'm doing a, a, a rural painting, I'll, I'll add power lines, telephone wires, whatever you call them. I'll add them even if they're not there simply because they look good and they break up the sky in such a nice manner. I was saying something, wasn't I? I forget now what it was. Oh yeah, don't don't edit and compose in the same pass. So right now, see I'm I'm just doing pencil lines. Not editing, not thinking, hmm, maybe there's too many pencil lines. No no no, just just draw the heck out of the thing. Because I know that I'm going to come back later. The time for editing is later. When I will, yes, indeed, without any question, I will be removing many of these lines. But if you see, if I try to remove them and put them on at the same time, I'll just get myself turned into a, into a mental pretzel.
Um, that, that's, that's a good way to describe actually my entire painting process. There, all the underlayers, all of the underlayers are creative, creating, making, making, making. Only the final edit layer is final edit. I think that helps me a good bit to, to get paintings done. And to get them done with some dispatch, some some speed. By the way, I, I discovered who bit my ankle when I first got out here. A few minutes ago when I walked back over there toward my car, I discovered a great big fire ant nest right outside the door of my van. So no doubt that's what got me. And fire ants don't aren't bothered much by mosquito repellent. They turn up their noses at that say, who the heck cares? We're going to bite you anyway. <laughs> A little bit of story. My wife and I lived, for actually for nine years of our married life, we lived in Texas, two different places in Texas, Fort Worth and San Saba. And uh, fire ants are a real, real issue in reality. <laughs> They're a fact of life. They're, they have to, you have to deal with fire ants if you live in Texas and anywhere in the Southwest. We moved to Raleigh 29 years ago, and I'm not kidding. One of the great little reliefs, <laughs> I don't know if I told anybody this, but one of the great little reliefs in the back of my mind was two things. No fire ants and no um, scorpions. I was so relieved that there were no fire ants in North Carolina. Well, that was 29 years ago, and in the 29 years... <laughs> Those dang fire ants have caught up, have caught up to me. They have arrived, and they are now, yeah, a force to be reckoned with in all of North Carolina as well. So they're creeping their way north up the east coast. Dad burn critters. Hello. Hi, how are you? You're talking yourself? Uh, yeah, either I'm wow. talking to myself. Or I'm pretending I'm talking to a camera, one or the other. But oh, you're more than you. No, 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 no. You're more than welcome. <laughs> they know that people come by. So what do you think? Beautiful. You own this property? <laughs> I just, uh, I've admired it as well. I, thank you. It is. I jumped in my van an hour and a half ago and said, I want to go paint. I was looking for real America. Oh, okay. Something. <laughs> Don't you think? Nice. Thank you. So I'm about 75% finished. About, uh... My daughter painted too. Does she really? That is a good it. skill. She How old is she? Oh, good. Good. I'm telling her to keep going. Does she study art in school? Yes. Good for her. Yeah. That's good. Well, it applies to, it's useful in many different careers yeah. besides just being an artist like me. Yeah, like good. Good, good. So, most of what's on the canvas is actually acrylics, water based, fast drying acrylics. The only thing that's, this, these are oil paints. There's a thin glaze of oil over the whole thing. And uh, now I'm about to start painting in uh, oils. So I do acrylic underneath and oil on top. That's a little bit unusual, not, not extremely rare, but a little bit. And you think you do, you do this every day? <laughs> yes, I'm a full-time artist. I wish really? I went out like this every day. I don't, but I, this is my job. Really? Yeah. Aren't I lucky? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I am very blessed indeed to be able to do what I love for a living. Yeah. Very much so. And you live close here? Yeah, I do live just about five miles down the road. And you left school for this, or you just going at home? Um, I did go to school, but I don't recommend it. It was a waste of time and money. Yeah, it is. 
um, in college, that is. Mm-hmm. I don't mean school is a waste of time. I just mean art. being an art major was, was a waste of time and money. I didn't know it at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, if your daughter wants to be an artist, do not send her to university. Unless she wants to be an art teacher, okay. But if she wants to be an artist, no, do not major in art. Because they don't teach art at the university. Yeah. What they teach, they try to teach their students how to survive and thrive in the art establishment. And the art establishment is what you see when you go to the North Carolina Art Museum. Have you ever been there? The mm-hmm. modern section, yeah. not the old yeah. section. The modern stuff. It's just like weird, ugly stuff on the wall. Yeah. Political, very political, very preachy. That's what they're trying to get their students to do. They don't teach them skill at all. So if your daughter has skill, don't send her there. If she wants to be a preacher, then she can make her an honor. If she's going into yeah, politics, she's, she, she's then she can go into art. When she saw somebody painting like this, she's very alive. So she loved to see that. Yeah, yeah. She would love if she saw her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, then, 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 uh, There are a lot. There are plenty of other places to learn how to be an artist, but the uh, university is not is not one of them. In fact, they would they would try to convince her that doing beautiful paintings is a very bad idea. Yeah, she's got a lot of paintings in the house. Good. Yeah. Does she go to high school around here somewhere? Yeah, fun high school. Oh yeah, yeah, good. She can learn good art in high school, but not in college. What a beautiful day, especially in the shade. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. So when I show this my daughter, she'll love it. Good. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Here, let me give you a card. Yeah, yeah watch out for fire ants. Yeah, you know it's very really There are fire ants so around here somewhere. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> yeah, one bit me as soon as I get out of the car. <laughs> Thank you. you. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Yeah, yeah. she loves this. She loves it. She can stay all day. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah, yeah, I know the feeling. Yep. And she's just got two pictures like last week on, you know, Lewisburg High School? Uh huh. No, college in Lewisburg. Yeah. You know, they send the pictures there, like the good really? the children's. Yeah. Excellent. And two of her pictures get there last week. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. What are the pictures of? Yeah, she loves to see this. Picture. What is it? What are they? Pictures of what? It was Her, a house. A house? A house. Yeah. She make, she make a very old house like this one. Uh-huh. Where like in winter time, you know the trees is dry. Uh-huh. With, uh, with a long, long road inside to the yeah. woods. But all the trees is no got no, no uh, leaves because it's yeah. snowing. Like yeah. Like got a lot of snow. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That was pretty good. good for her. Tell her to keep on. Don't give up. And if you're, and t- tell her that I paint with two hands. That's why I see. That's why I want to show her <laughs> yeah. yeah. She paint only with one. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not very many people paint with two hands. Yeah, that's why I see. It's I am a pioneer. I'm trying to get a lot of other people to paint with two hands. Yeah, that's why she needs to stop. Think about it. All musicians use two hands. Mm-hmm. All musicians mm-hmm. use two hands. If, yeah, it's true. Nobody thinks anything about that. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Yeah. Bless you. Yes, Shake sir. your daughter's hand and tell yes, her I pass on a blessing to her yes. too, okay? Yes. Good, beautiful job. <laughs> Thank you. Even though it's not actually happening in the picture, I feel like there ought to be a um, little bit of a shadow of the truck on the on the 
still put it back there. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so theoretically, <laughs> in theory, I'm ready to go to the last layer. Now, sometimes I do a, a glow layer, fuzz layer, translucent layers of color with soft edges. Now, let me think for a minute. Do I want to do that this time? Um, yes, I do. One of the functions of the fuzz layer, the glow layer, is uh, correcting local color, that local, that for art, in art language, that just means the realistic, the real color. You know, roses are red, violets are blue color. And um, I do indeed, in fact, want to um, make this grass down here greener. So, mixing up some yellow and various greens to get a greener color down here in there. I don't, I don't typically do a lot of green, even that much, in, in my paintings normally. Um, a little green goes a long way, in my opinion. But, but I feel like it's appropriate a little bit in this painting. So let's get some green in there and back here. Okay, I think that's enough of that. Now, yep, and a little bit more. I want to do some um, some blue. Let's take, take a minute. Clean up my uh, palette, though. Just have a, a straight razor with a piece of tape on it. This is my not very fancy palette cleaner. It's a part of my Soltec diesel. Now, finally, some white paint. I like to point out to students at this point in the painting process, sorry about the rough ride there, that uh, look at the painting the way it is right now and register that there is no white paint mixed in with any of these colors. Now, I did, I did, as you know, a couple layers of acrylic white, but it was pure white. It wasn't a color. Um, I say that because uh, the traditional approach to oil painting, of course, the, the, the artist uses more white than anything else. And the same is true of me, by the way. But so far, I haven't used any white on this canvas. And yet, look how much... Uh, value uh, expression already already exists in the painting it's already well on its way to its to its final color and if you're if you're trying to imitate my technique um, it, do make note of that that um, the the more accurate job you do in the underpainting stage then um, the less work you have to do in the final edit. A great event. Okay, I just mixed up some some reddish pink. Let me add some 
coins to that. Okay. I want these. So again, this is the fuzz layer. So no hard edges. This is all fuzzy. There. There's some nice messy pink. Done with that. Clean those brushes. Now. What else in the fuzz department? Yep, some blue. Definitely want to do some blue. I think I can keep using oh, those brushes are too small. There we go. By the way, um, yes, you can use the same brushes for oils and acrylics. Um, AC Moore, in particular, a very popular arts and crafts store in, in America, uh, achieved a, a marketing coup years ago when they fooled their customers by saying these brushes are for acrylics and these brushes over here are for oils. <laughs> Brilliant marketing strategy. So now all the students who don't know any better think they have to buy two of everything. Beautiful. Not true. You can use the same brushes for oil and acrylics. It doesn't hurt a bit. In my opinion, not a bit. Now, acrylics are a lot harder on your brushes than the oils are. Oils are easy on your brushes. It's the acrylics that are hard because you have to, they dry so quickly while, you're, while you are still using them, the acrylic dries in your brushes and it makes it very hard to, to get the acrylics out. And, um, and even when you're done with your, your acrylic brushes and you try to clean them, it's hard to clean them thoroughly enough. And um, they get gunked up with dry acrylic paint. Several companies make make a product to uh, to get dry paint out of brushes, and I use it all. But trust me, none. Once a brush gets hardened, it's never quite the same. I use them, but. They're, they're never, they never quite recover. They're not like they were before. And it's the acrylic that's the culprit, not the oil. Even dried oil paint is easier to get out of your brushes than dried acrylics. Too much blue in that. Paint with the tissue. <laughs> more white in this mixture. So here I am, I'm definitely, this is definitely fuzz, fuzz layer right here. The fuzz layer is really, when you're doing a landscape, is really good for atmospheric perspective, by the way. You can really, like I did right there, I just pushed that bank of trees way back where, where they ought to be. Same thing here. Just pushed that bank of trees, distant trees, way back just by fuzzing uh, this blue, pale blue on top of them. Okay, that's better. I was debating not doing a fuzzle here, but now I'm really glad that I did. It's really the green, the red, and the blue have all been really helpful. While I'm at it, I'm going to do one more layer of fuzz, and that will be the white. And by the way, so I, I mentioned... While I was doing the pencil stuff many minutes ago, I, I mentioned that uh, in the course of the next three or four layers, a lot of the pencil would be covered up. And that is especially true with the, if you do much fuzz, this layer right here really covers up the pencil a lot. So much so that some, often I come back after a fuzz layer and actually redo some pencil. Yes, I, my, 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 my heart is in my throat when I do that kind of crazy, crazy, crazy painting, that messy stuff. Um, and painting with two hands helps because my brain can't quite keep up with the motion, the speed of two hands. So it helps, it keeps me from thinking too carefully about what I'm doing. 
See all that all that messiness right there? Um Mixing up again a little bit of pale, pale green for even more, more fuzz back here. I feel like the uh, the green peeking through underneath it on the far side of the truck is uh, very important element, visual element in the painting. on the fuzz layer. I don't think I need to do more pencil this time. There's still plenty of pencil showing through. And I'm finally, finally, finally down to the last stage of the painting process. Now, I don't know how long I've been painting. I, as always, I forgot to look at my watch when I started. You guys can tell me how long I've been painting because you got it. The video is telling you how many minutes. Um, hour and a half? Hour and 40? I don't know, something like that. Um, ah, I got to make one minor change. Still sort of, sort of in the fuzz layer. The shadow up here at the top of this house is just too dark. I got it dark enough and then, oh, wait a minute, that's too dark. So first of all, I'm gonna to try to fix it just by painting with a rag. That might do the job. Yep, probably did. That's probably good enough. Okay, so I am now down to final layer. Light, that is light color, light value, opaque, highlights, tending toward hard edges. Sparkle, all those words would be appropriate. Um, I've been calling it lately final edit. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe nine or ten layers on the canvas. I call every one of those underpainting. This is the only layer that I call overpainting <laughs> or final edit. Now, the better work, the, the, the more accurate my underpainting each layer has been, then the less work I have to do. But my goal in the underpainting was not to be accurate. In fact, Here's a, a description of my painting process, and I think, sort of, in a way, anybody's good painting process. Layer, 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 right? That's, and that's, that's different from the way a lot of students paint. A lot of students think, okay, I'm going to paint the sky. Break out the brush, stick out the tongue, paint the sky. Then I'm going to paint the trees. That, that's not called layers. That's called you finish the sky, then you finish the hill, then you finish the tree, then so on and so forth, moving forward. No, good painting is layer, layer, layer. Uh, bad painting, and I, this analogy I use a lot, the student, they're painting a pumpkin, they stick, take the brush, stick it in orange paint, and paint the pumpkin, they're done. Good painter, like me, <laughs> I stick my paint in every color in the world and do 10 layers. Later, we have the impression of an orange pumpkin, but it's pumpkin, but it's got all kinds of interesting interplay underneath it that's peeking through. So that's that's what I'm aiming for here. Um, so every every stage of the underpinning process is very abstract, but the cumulative effect, what you see here, is fairly realistic, right? Not hyper-realism by any means, but you can tell it's a barn, a truck, containers, trees, barn, you know, you know what all that is. And it's going to be even more realistic in just a few minutes when I finish this last layer. Uh, so, and even the last layer by itself is fairly abstract, but the cumulative effect of all those layers is realism. Okay, now, there are four different places to start this last layer. The furthest away object, the sky, that's option number one. Now, option number two, focal point. Option number three, the lightest, brightest, whitest thing. And option number four is any major area that needs local color. Can hey, man. I, can hey. I see? Yeah, absolutely you can. Oh. Thanks Thanks for coming by. I'm either no talking to people on the on YouTube or I'm schizophrenic and I'm talking to myself. That's no problem at all. <laughs> Two options. I do it all the time. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, did you just drive by? Drove and, by. and happen to see what I was doing? Exactly. Thank you. Getting there. I'm nearly finished. I'm nearly finished. But the last layer is the most realistic. I tighten it up, tighten things up the most. I think I'm going to start today with the, the light stuff on that. So you're going to put some highlights in there. I am, exactly. Exactly. That is the word. Highlights and details. Okay. All right. <laughs> Are you an artist? Are you artistic? Oh, very artistic. Are you really? Very good for you, artistic. man. Very good artistic. for you. That's why you stopped. Exactly. <laughs> very good. Good to meet you. Thanks for stopping by. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Yeah, when I first got here, it was this, a lot of what attracted me to this scene was this triangle, this inverted V, white, peeling paint, sticking up uh, into the sky. Definitely a place for a hard edge. Now, speaking of hard edges, you, if you've watched me for long, you've heard this little mantra before, but it bears repeating. Especially if I'm listening, because I need to hear this more than any of y'all. It is really, really easy for a painting to have too many hard edges. Nearly impossible for a painting to have too many soft edges. So what's that tell you? Array for soft edges. Beware of, be very, very, very careful of hard edges. Now this is focal point, I believe, right here. Secondary over here with the cab. So I am doing quite a few hard edges right here. But I had better be really on my on my toes. Uh, as I proceed to other parts of the canvas. Really better be careful. And not continue. Don't let this I'm saying to myself. Okay, Nelson, watch out. I'm, I am so comfortable making these hard edges. Like hard edges is my middle name. Dan Hard Edges Nelson. <laughs> I'm so comfortable making hard lines. If I'm not careful, I will just overdo it. Now, there are a number of things you can do if you find you've done too many hard edges. You, you can come back and soften them. That is one way to do it, but I, I don't want to rely on that too much because the, the um, scumbled, like I would, I would take a fan brush, which I'm assuming I have here somewhere. <laughs> Whoa. I have to fix that because I need a fan brush. In every, so I would take a brush like this then. And um, just, you know, well, I'll do it right now. Just, just to do it again. There. Again, I don't know how much that you can see. You can see that little color just out there. I'm going to keep this brush right there. Um, 
Same thing with, now with my thumb. There you go. So I'm softening edges. That's usually a good idea. And if you want something to look like it's really glowing, like this white against the the, the, uh, the lowering, lowering sky, threatening sky. Um, if you want it to really look like it's the, the sun is really hitting it, then you want a soft edge, not a hard one. Some of you need to learn that lesson. I'm going to um, dirty this, this um, white that I'm using. Go to a dirtier white. So I'm mixing oxide red and ultramarine. Just making it gray, or actually grayer, but a warm gray. Grayer than it was, but still a warm gray. Nope, that needs to be cooler than that. Okay, let's try that. Yeah. Now, again, if any of you are trying, if you want to try to, if you're chasing my technique at all, here's it. And when, when students take my classes, it is at this point that they tend to blow it. Um, it is at this point that they tend to say, oh, thank God I can stop all that nonsense and I can start painting normal. And then they proceed to plaster paint over all of that beautiful underpainting that they just spent a couple hours creating. Okay? So the danger at this phase, this stage, is to cover, paint up, paint, cover up too much. And in the final stage, um, uh, hang on. I was going to say something, then I got distracted by my own painting process. In the final stage, um, uh, I want to cover up as little as possible. Okay. I'm not sure that's what I was going to say, but that'll do. <laughs> Whoa, something sweet is happening right now that I did not even anticipate, that I did not plan myself. It's just happening. Um, happy accident. I say this often, I mean it way more than you can possibly imagine. I say. I am not smart enough to paint good. Proper English, I'm not smart enough to paint well. But then the, the, the expression doesn't work if I use good grammar, so let me go back. I'm not smart enough to paint good, but I'm smart enough to spot and see some good painting when I see it. You see why I have to use bad grammar? I'm not smart enough to paint good, but I am smart enough to, to recognize some good painting when I see it. And that means, and then to stop. So in other words, I was thinking in my lame brain that I would paint this whole wall of this house, you know, white, because, because look, <laughs> the, uh, the sun is shining on the whole thing, right? has been ever since I've been here. The sun's been shining on the whole thing. So that's sort of what I had in the back of my mind that that's the way I should paint. Um, but I got down this far and went, oh, wait a minute. That's looking a lot better if I just paint the top half of the house that bright and let the bottom half go dull. Oh yeah, why didn't I think of that? Well, the reason is because I'm not smart enough to paint good. But thank God I got I'm smart enough to see some recognize some good painting when I see it and to stop, put on the brakes.
Um, it's okay. I feel like I need to do the some blue sky next because uh, painting this. You can see that. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Uh, forgive me. I just got a little bit irritated today. What are you painting? I'm sorry. Oh, Lord, help me to be more patient with people who are blind as a bat. Okay, we all have our gifts. Not everybody has to be able to see as well as I can see. <laughs> okay, this and that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> What are you painting? And, and, and the poor guy's just being friendly, and here I am ridiculing him. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you painting? <laughs> what are you painting? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go back to being Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> sorry. Whew, you already helped me. <laughs> what are you painting? <laughs> Is that the Mona Lisa? You doing a painting of a submarine? <laughs> Are you painting cows? Are you doing a portrait of your mother? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I hope you're not. I hope, sincerely hope you're not seeing or hearing the real Dan Nelson here. You're hearing the bad Dan Nelson when he's fallen out of his good mind and he's in his snarky brain. <laughs> I, I, I can't quite figure out what you're painting over there. <laughs> uh, okay, that's enough. Stop. <laughs> what you laughing about? Nothing. Oh, yeah. Not laughing at anybody. Aren't you glad we're all different? Okay, so I'm about to ruin the nice little smudge that I made a little while ago. That's that's unfortunate. What I've done here is what I do in much of the final layer is I have uh, mixed up a, a color, blue-gray color, to, to try to pretty much match what is already on the canvas. But this is layers of... This is layers of transparent and translucent color. Layers and layers and layers. Got it? But I'm now coming in with a final layer of opaque paint, but I'm trying to match the color of what's already there. Um, because it creates this real fun little wiggle of confusion, I've been calling it this week. A wiggle of confusion in our brain that we can't, the viewer can't quite tell what's on top of what. Can't quite tell. Um, now, there's that. And, uh, what's going on there? Okay, and that's, even though we would say normally in most of life we don't like being confused, when it comes to visual art, we in fact do. That is part of the, one of the large aesthetic pleasures that we get from visual, from painting is little momentary confusion. Can't quite tell what's on top of what here. Where did that color where did that color come from? Was that put on early or is that is that is that something early that's peeking through or something late that was put on at the end? Can you hear me? Playing games with with the viewer's eyes. That that is what the viewer wants. That is, the, the best paintings in the world are the ones that, in fact, manipulate the viewer the most. And again, I like saying that because because most of us, of course, we're all uppity and even sort of politically correct. Sort of, we say, I don't like being manipulated. I don't like people messing with me. Well, I, when it comes to visual art, you do, whether you know it or not. You probably don't. Most people don't realize that what they really like about visual art is being manipulated. Um, but I'm just, I'm talking art, talk, I'm talking to artists here. It is your job to skillfully manipulate the viewer. The more skillful you are at it, the more pleasure the viewer will experience in looking at you. I'm sorry, I 
just missed a comment. Sorry. Uh, a friend of mine's number one. I forgot. Um, the way this will work, I'll, I'll see your chats um, later on tonight when I get home to my desktop computer. I can see the chats that people left a lot of times, especially out here because I can't see this my screen very well. I don't see a flash when a, when a comment comes up. So I'm very sorry about that. And somebody just left one and disappeared right, right when it caught my eye. So uh, feel free to try again. in this scene, largely because of their color. Um, they, they would be just silhouetted against the sky, and they proceed in that direction, but very, very carefully. So if you follow me very often, if you watch me very often, you know that I'm, I am bonkers about transparent color, right? Because transparent color is more visually rich than opaque color. Then the, the, the question might be then, well, then shouldn't your painting be entirely made up of opaque color? The answer to that is no. I mean, it's, I'm sorry, shouldn't your painting be entirely made up of transparent color if, if you're so all fired up, if you're convinced that transparent color is more interesting and more rich more visually stimulating all of those are true statements and I'm sorry about the wind you're getting here um, but variety trumps transparency so in other words having a painting that has some transparent and some opaque is more interesting than a painting that has only transparent now, clearly, a painting that was all transparent would be more interesting than a painting that is all opaque. But still, uh, the principle of variety trumps that. So a painting that has some opaque and some transparent. Lots of noise. Country living at its fine. Okay, I'm gonna stop with the stop right there with the sky for just a minute. I'll probably come back and do more. Um let's smooth smooth out that one stroke. Oh let me let me take care of a a missing piece while I'm here though. Um I wanna paint that uh power line, I mean the, the telephone pole. Um in the dark transparent typically when you want to get dark you use a transparent color transparent paint you don't buy transparent paint it is transparent because you add medium to it <laughs> that's of course entirely too way too rigid stiff okay so before before I clean off my sky color brushes then let me let's clean up this
sorry, Marcus. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Big noisy truck. <sighs> okay, I am going to jump over here and start painting these pink salmon colored tanks on the back of this truck. Want to see those one more time? There they are. Let's do some of the highlights now on those tanks. If you've watched me before, if I can say it, I'll say it again. It is more important that these marks that I'm making, well, actually all the marks that I'm making, but especially in the final edit thing, it's more important that these marks be interesting marks. It's more important than that they be accurate. Accurate is important. Interesting is even more important. What is interesting? Well, variety is the single greatest, most, the single most important ingredient, if you will, of interestingness. <laughs> variety. Um, a degree of unpredictability, I guess, is one way. I'm trying to come up with new language to describe what makes something interesting, what makes a mark interesting. A lack of predictability. Um, in a way, that means I'm being very careful that my hands don't move in a predictable manner. No, that's, that's not a good end of that sentence. That, that they don't move in a manner that is consistent with the way that my anatomy was put together. Okay? Like your hand makes this mark. Your hand makes certain marks very, very easily because of the way that it's constructed. It would be a big mistake to yield to the impulse, the temptation, if you will, to move in that manner simply because it's easy. And that is the default. That is what most students do by default. When they're doing brushy, 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 what they're doing is painting natural. And painting ugly. Okay, so I've mixed up the more pale version. What's there not pale enough? Let me add some more white to that. case in this painting I actually do want some of it I kind of like that little um, outline edge even though in in the world in reality 
you know, when we look at those tanks over there, there's no black outline along the top of them. True, there is not. So if I were doing, if I were doing very realistic, photorealistic, hyper-realistic painting, there most certainly would not be any kind of outline up there. But of course, I'm not doing any of those things. I'm trying to create a painting that is interesting to look at. And I, I am finding, this is not, this is not painting by principle, this is painting by eyeballs. I'm finding that I, I like a little bit of that black outline. It's not realism at all. I'm not doing it because it's realistic. I'm doing it because it looks cool. In fact, that's a... Again, forgive me for all this wind noise. It wasn't windy when I started today. I left the house. I didn't think I was going to have any problem with the wind. Um, that's a good way to describe all good painting. <laughs> Why'd you do that? Quote unquote. Why'd you do that? That's what good painting. That's why you do everything. Every mark. Every mark would have exactly the same answer. Every question thus framed would have exactly the same answer. Why'd you do that? Because it looks cool. The answer is not because that's what it looks like in reality. Here's a good example. This post, this rough lumber holding up this lean-to over here is most certainly not orange. But just by some quirk of accident in the layers that I painted, there's, there's a slight orange blush right there. And right at the moment, I have a dull orange color on my paint. And I looked over and said, huh, you know what? Orange would be a really good color to put over here. Now, am I doing it because there's orange here? Well, that's a good idea. But no, I, it, that's not really why I'm doing it. That's just a good excuse. So yeah, I put this orange over here to counterbalance this orange over here. That really is a good principle. But no, that's not why I did it. I did it because I looked over there and saw it and said, huh, yeah, orange would be cool there. And again, that's a good example of why in the underpainting stages you want to create a very high degree of visual chaos. It is so that you have lots and lots and lots to respond to in the final painting process. I'm just looking at the scene in front of me right here, by the way, and noticing how many little bits of yellow-orange there are. A reflector there, a reflector there. I don't know what that little pink right there is. I don't know how well you can see this. I have no idea what that is, but you can guarantee I'm not eliminating that. I'm not smart enough to paint good, but dang, I'm smart enough to recognize some good painting when I see it. And even though the uh, the tractor over there underneath this lean-to is a green and yellow John Deere, um, I'm turning it into a Massey Ferguson, <laughs> which means it's going to be a red tractor. Very dull red, very dark red. Why? Because it looks cool. <laughs> are, you, are you catching this? Answer to every question, because it looks cool. Why'd you do that? Because it looks cool. Now, you know, that doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. <laughs> we do things that don't look cool, like, whoops, <laughs> shouldn't have done that. It didn't look cool. I thought it would look cool, when it didn't. That's probably enough red right there. One more tiny stroke. Yep. Now there's a kind of a weird... That's, I'm probably done with that tractor. I don't need any more detail than that. Ooh, but I do... Here's a red. There's a red reflector. Man, I'm not going to miss this, uh, this chance. Opportunity for a little bit of zingy color right here that is going to be so sweet. Right here, reflector. Right there. <laughs> That's nice. I need some gray now. So I had I had red 
fiery red on my brushes, so I just picked up some green and uh, mixed the red and green together. I have sort of a warm, dull. Now I've done some violet as I'm pursuing. Now I'm pretty close to a neutral gray. So you see, to, to mix a gray, you never have to clean your brushes before you mix gray. Just start with whatever's on your brushes and go from there. So there's this little box hanging down from the truck right here. And even though, in reality, the box has no reddish orange on it, um, it certainly is going to stay red-orange in this painting. Why? Okay, now, you answer the question. Why did I do that? Because, exactly, because it looks cool. End of conversation, because it looks cool. The, the, the challenge for us painters is to try to learn and learn and learn and learn and learn and learn what it is that looks cool. Sometimes you don't even have to know why it looks cool. You just have to learn that it looks cool. Um, I'm going to cool down this gray, a little bit more, a little bit more bluish gray to do some work on these tires. Whenever possible, you allow the underpainting to do the work. Whenever possible. Because the underpainting is good looking. And why is the underpainting good looking? Because it's fresh, energetic, chaotic, and transparent. Energetic and transparent, probably the two best words. Why is the underpainting more beautiful than the overpainting? Because the underpainting is fresh energetic and transparent so transparent first of all is always better but the energy because of the manner in which it was painted and if you watched if you were watching me you saw the manner in which it was painted with, with great freedom and abandon it was painted very quickly right i was saying this yesterday when i discovered 14, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, when I discovered that the best painting actually happened by accident. The best painting happened when you were trying hard to do something, when I was trying hard to do something else. Then I said, well, why not just do something else, which is exactly what you, you when you see me paint my technique. It's doing, it's not controlled, it's doing something else, painting by accident. Okay, I'm going to stop with the this part of the truck just for a bit. Oh no, I'm not. First of all, first of all, before I do that, I'm going to paint some dark detail. So I need to. Now I'm I'm cheating here. I'm, I'm cheating my system, my technique, because I'm backing up and I'm going to do some dark, dark details, dark transparent. Now in theory, all the dark stuff was already done. In theory, in reality, this is what happens sometimes. I I get painting along. Go. Oh wait a minute. This area right here is supposed to be dark. So I'm mixing up very transparent, very dark, uh, violet, phthalo, ultramarine, and brown oxide red. All those mixed together make virtually a black. I can either make it a warm black or a cool black. I want it to be a cool black, I think. Okay.
correcting, modifying my drawing a little bit, I, I realized that my wheels here are a little too high. So I'm lowering them down a little bit. And in theory, anytime you add dark paint to your canvas, then that's just a, a setup, a wind-up, the preparatory for for the fulfillment, which is light paint. And that that is not unique to Dan Nelson. That is a universal art teacher, painting teacher. Darks first. Light slides. Every rule can be broken, you bet. Just because there's an exception doesn't mean it's not a rule. If you don't know what the rules are, if you think there aren't any rules, you're probably just screwing up. Probably. And the good teachers, the good painters who tell you there aren't any rules, they're just being a temporary smart ass. Sorry. I usually warn you before I use bad words. Bleep, let's avoid that tape. But what I said was true. It doesn't mean they're always a smart Alec, but for that moment they are being a smart Alec because they want to sound smart. Um, if they are a good painter, they paint by the rules. They're just, it's a, this just semantics. They're just they're just arguing semantics. And what most people say, if they say, they don't want any rules, blankety, blankety, blank, <laughs> speaking of bad language, they say, you give me a rule and I can show you a, set, a painting, a great painting that breaks through. Uh-huh. The exception does not prove that there is no rule. In fact, the exception only proves that there is a rule because it's clear that it's an exception. Okay, I'm going to stop ranting and raving about that. Uh, So one of the rules that I just mentioned was darks first, lights last. too neat there. A little bit too fastidious word I like. A little bit too fussy. Um, That's pretty fussy drawing, and that concerns me a little bit. Um, yeah, that helped a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just because you do something like that doesn't mean you have to settle for every single thing that happened in the course of that little bit of chaos. Um, 
I can come back. I like it generally. A little bit too much smear right here. So I'm going to remove some of that. A little bit. Not all of it. A little bit too much right here. Just took a tiny bit off there. This edge you're going to soften. Soften again. And then, and then redefine with a fingernail and a rag. Ah, that's better. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there. There, that's nice. Ah, that's nice. Good, good, good. So the stuff that I just put on black, I'm just coming off in, in certain areas, just lifting it off, and we, then we see the, the fascinating uh, underpainting, the stuff that was underneath that black. And I'm quite happy with that now. I'm ready to go on to uh, the grass. The, there are several parts of the painting that aren't finished yet. The cab, tiny bit of work in this part of the truck, tiny bit. Cab, this tree, and the grass. And, and sky over here, and the sky. Okay, so I have, I have my work cut out for me. Um, I want to tackle the, the grass. It's the, it's the lack of green grass. I don't really mean green, it's not color. It's a, lack, a value issue, values issue down there that is um, rubbing me uh, the wrong way, so. Here's a funny little, for what it's worth, in my Soltec easel, this Soltec easel, um, these are, can you see that far down? Yeah, you can. Um, those are all Alkid paints for some reason. I just decided, huh, I think it'd be nice to have one easel that has all fast dry. So that's what that is. Not, by no means a lesson or anything in that, just a silly preference, just a silly experiment. Um, all my other oil paint kits are regular oil paints. This is the only one that's uh, Alkid. Normally, I, I have uh, Alkid. My titanium white is Alkid. I, again, I'm, if you follow me, you know that. That's old news around here. Dan Nelson's titanium white is Alkid. That has been that way for years and years and years. But everything else is regular, except for my soul tech. used easels because I don't paint this small very often. Um, I enjoy painting big. I really do large. One of the things that clearly caught my eye in this scene from the moment I drove up was this uh, this chartreuse um, yellow, pale yellow green, spring green perhaps, some would call it, peeking underneath the, the dark undercarriage of the truck. So I'm finally getting around to that. And then, if that's the color beyond the truck, then I need, of course, some of that on this side of the truck. Um... And decide how much more of this color to do and of course where to do it um, okay I know what I want over right there I want the same color with uh, a bunch of 
yellow ochre in it. Uh, green and brown. <laughs> I've got all kinds of little twigs landing in my paint. <laughs> it's to prove to prove that it was done on plain air. Dead bugs and pieces of plant in your in your painting. Prove <laughs> it was done on plain air. Um, see, I, by the way, I, if you were with me a while ago, I, you know, my painting at the early stages is so fast. It looks like I'm going to be done the entire painting in, in, in an hour and 20 minutes. But it, it bogs down considerably at this stage. The last stage is the slowest. a sweet I want to bring you in real close just for a minute so hang on for the for the bouncy ride okay let me zoom in as much as I can just for a minute because I want to I want you students to see this little square right here there's a slight purple cast to it right in a sense, I have no idea how that purple got there. Now, I could very carefully go back and retrace my steps and think, well, yeah, belly, 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 belly. yeah okay, but that doesn't matter. The, the fact is, I, I don't really remember how it got there. Uh, once again, I'm not smart enough to put purple right there. But having seen purple there, I'm smart enough to go, oh, whoa, 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 what a sweet, what a sweet little accent. I want to get so I've, I've been trying to mix up I've tried to match that color as closely as I can and then probably maybe just one tick lighter than that and come in here and actually and for one thing I'm going to diminish that pencil line but I'm diminish, diminishing it with a little blush of lavender there's a little bit of the same thing up here and just put a tiny bit there you can hardly even see that oh and underneath the eave this would be a nice place for some purple. I, I want you to understand that I'm painting by eye. I'm not painting by formula. Always put lavender under the eaves. <laughs> That's it's absurd. No, it's, I saw this lavender here, and then there, and then it made me think, oh, it'd be good to put it up there. Now, it's a little bit too neat. Let me mess that up a little bit. Now it's a little too solid. Let me scrape through a little bit. Okay, I'm going to move you back where you were now. Um, in a way, that's what I mean by painting by eye, not by formula, not by theory, not by strategy. Just paint by eye. I'm going to do the same thing again. And by the way, as you, I have quite a laundry list of things that still need doing in this painting, right? Um, this needs more variety of color. It's too flat. I need to do some white highlights here. The green here is nice, but all of this green here is the same color. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> Slowing down traffic now. Um, and the sky needs more light in it and probably some more blue. I, I like the feeling of the sky generally and this tree needs a lot of work this tree needs a little anyway but uh, I'm not going to do all that right now I'm going to I'm stuck doing little surprise things so just a minute ago I brought you in really close to show you that this lavender by the way it's, it's too much of a good thing so let me mess that up there you go um, by the same token there's a little bit of blush orange right there and up here and um, in this case I actually do know how that got there that got there because it it when I painted the this area I, I let orange go all over so there's some there some here and some here in the sky so I, I do remember how this got there it doesn't matter be that as it may it's not something I did so to speak on purpose it's something that just happened 
as a result of my chaotic underpainting technique. But now that I see it there, I'm going, ooh, a little bit more of that would be really sweet. And again, one of the reasons it's sweet is that our brain is mildly confused about what's on top of what because now some of this orange is underpainting peeking through and some of the orange is overpainting on top and it creates a little bit of visual chaos a little vibration a little wiggle of what's going on here and our brain likes that <laughs> let me use that by the same token you probably can't see it but there's tiny bits of red here in the sky up here 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 all of this and that's a good example of this uh, very universal principle that our eyes get a kick out of seeing little bits of the object in the background and little bits of object background in the object okay so in this case the object are these pink plastic tanks right and our eye gets a kick out of seeing little bits of pink there, 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 all along here and in the house. There's pink all over the place. Okay, so that, that little bit explains why I paint with this sort of wild and crazy abandon in the early stages of the painting process. It is so that accidents like that are bound to happen. Okay, I'm mixing up a pale or pale or um. Yeah, that's, that's too bright. Let me darken that a little bit. Uh, Phil... Stark. I never took from him, but my good friend David Foster did. David is a part of our Tuesday evening painters forum. We've been getting together for over 10 years, every second Tuesday of every month for, for over 10 years. And we share with each other things we're learning. And so Phil Stark, well, we've learned a lot from you, thanks to your student, David. Um, the terminology he uses for this is called broken color. Uh, broken values and broken color like this. This is basically an orange tank check and it's basically the color that I want But when you come in and you had just tiny little Variations in value that's a values break when you come in and add little bits of Same value but different color. That's a color break broken color uh, Phil if I'm Desecrating or misrepresenting you please forgive me and please jump on somewhere and correct me would you but that's as I understand it so it's just good terminology good different words from what I use yeah that's that's much better I like that um, a little bit of that orange color in the grass down here maybe it's reflection of in in a bit of water doesn't really matter doesn't matter. We like seeing bits of the object that have escaped into the background. And in this case, the, see the, the green is big, so it's background. This is object and background. Um, and I'm having a good time. I'm getting kind of tired. Um, I could force myself and finish this painting. Um, after a while, I get to hearing myself through your ears and thinking, good grief, does this guy ever shut up? And, of course, you don't say that because you just leave and go to <laughs> somewhere else somewhere else on, on YouTube. <laughs> but um, I, I, I almost get tired of hearing myself talk. I enjoy teaching very much. That's why I do this. But, you know, too much of a good thing is still too much of a good thing. I'm doing some, trying to do a hint of reflection secondary reflection on this plastic tank coming off the a gray blue blue gray coming off the, the house i don't know if that was successful or not but i'm going to leave it for the moment um let me go back 
So what I think I'm going to do here in a few minutes is I'm just going to uh, bid you guys a fond adieu. Uh, I won't stop the, uh, the, the, the episode because I, I'm, I think I can come back and let you see the final product. But I feel like I need to paint just by myself and quietly for a little while. I thought he'd never say that. <laughs> so this guy can talk the hind leg off a mule. Yeah, true. If I'm, te if I'm talking art, I can talk the hind leg off a mule. Keep all your mules locked up. <laughs> Fun. Not bad. I'm, I'm saying, not bad. Uh, but I'm going to take a little break give you guys a break <laughs> don't you guys have something more important to do <laughs> thank you so much for watching both those especially those of you who are watching <laughs> karen nah <laughs> i am humbled by your vote of confidence in your presence but uh, i'm going to take i've already told you what i'm going to do i'll tell you again sky tree sky uh, secondary highlights sparkle and all this this is almost done but just needs just a tiny bit here and there. By the way, this is going to be water reflected because we like to see water. Uh, we don't like water to, in our driveway, but we like water in other people's driveway. <laughs> and, the, and the cab here needs some white highlights. Okay, good enough. Thanks, I'll be back. Hey, welcome back friends. Welcome me, welcome you. <laughs> uh, so I was out painting uh, earlier this afternoon, perhaps you were watching me, and uh, painted for a while, and then sure enough, that storm that had been brewing over my right shoulder for an hour and a half <laughs> finally broke upon me. And, uh, of course, I was painting to the last possible second. And, of course, so I got halfway soaking wet. <laughs> uh, when will they ever learn? When will I ever learn? Anyway, um, so the t I'm nearly finished. I've done stuff with the sky and this tree. Uh, telephone pole, color, a little bit power lines. Some of the foreground... Um, let me talk about this foreground a, a kind of thing again. again I, I, let me tell you about a principle. Again, for those of you who are perhaps trying to learn my approach to painting. Let me say, by the way, I, I, I say this occasionally, but I haven't said it in a while. <laughs> um, I didn't set out to paint weird. Um, it just turned out that way. Um, in fact, I've had, over the years, sorry, my music's too loud, over the years, um, periodically, I've had misgivings and questions like, man, maybe I should paint more normal. Maybe I should paint more like other people. I think that especially when I don't do so well, you know, in a competition, don't, don't get into a show or something that, that makes you think, well... I do, by the way, just for what it's worth, I do think I, I haven't, and, and I don't think this is sour grapes, so I'm trying to be honest, and I think uh, I have not gotten into a couple of plein air uh, events simply because my stuff does not look like the current taste in plein air painting. Um, and that would cause me pause, except that I think there's a, I think there's a dreadful danger uh, extant in the in the planar community right now, of uh, of over saneness. Uh, this is always a danger. Let me let me tell you a real quick story, and I was going to talk about painting this green stuff, wasn't I? Okay, let me tell you. Let me I interrupt myself. In the in the my approach to painting, in the final stage, the final edit, a great deal of your the time is spent mixing up on the palette, an opaque match to what's here. Does that make sense? So uh, you don't, much of the, in the last, if you've done the underpaintings well, 
in the final edit, light opaque highlights, you don't invent a lot of new new things. You just match what's already there. Okay, so that's what you saw me do right there. Um, and then you just try to make interesting marks uh, uh, playing with uh, the underpainting so that there's this fun back and forth confusion that I've talked about a lot in the last several days. I was going to talk about something now and then I interrupted myself. What was it? I was talking about planar painting not getting into things. Oh, yeah, okay, here it is. I had an experience about 15 years ago. I, I'm not even sure that I was that I was a plain air. If so, it was more than 15. I'm not even sure that I was a, a fine artist, quote unquote. I may have still, this may have still been back in my days as an, as an illustrator. Um, I had a, an experience that has turned into a, a seminal event for me. Do you, do you know what that means? A seed like uh, an event that has really lodged its way uh, deeply into my psyche. Um, it was this. I walked into one of the more snobby galleries in Raleigh, and I, I, I don't say that with contempt. Um, it, that, is a, that, is a, um, that is a market angle, a market strategy, you know, in every town of any size anyway there's got there's got to be the gallery that tries to get a corner on the snob market and again I'm, I'm i'm not really dissing it that's just the reality so i walked into one of the snob galleries <laughs> in uh in raleigh and the sign out front said greatest north carolina painters of all time they were having a show a temporary show greatest painters of and of, of from of from North Carolina. Now, at first, I was thought, "Oh yeah, come on." But I walked in, and I thought, "Oh, okay, wow," because they they had they had artists going back at least fifty or sixty years, as I remember. Um, I'm not sure they went back any further than that. So, in other words, they were they were giving a a good shot to to be uh, fair with history and and uh, say, "No, no, we're, we're we're really trying to collect math. We're trying to." Um, a mass here, um, truly, you know, throughout history. Anyway, so I was, kudos to them, hats off to them for, for doing that. Um, but as soon as I walked into the gallery, I sort of gasped. They had beautiful paintings. It was good stuff. Francis Spate was in there. Um, He's, he is particularly meaningful to my family and I because we live on Spate Circle, named after Francis Spate. Francis Spate ended his career at East Carolina University at the art department there, and there's a building named after him. He was, he was quite famous before he came to ECU. He just finished his life and career here in North Carolina. Anyway, so our, the street we live on is named after Francis Spate. Um, but it was a lot of a lot of old artists from the... 50s, 60s, 70s, and so forth. Well, the reason I gasped is as soon as I walked into the room and just did a, did a, did a 360 and looked at what was on the wall, um, I realized that I knew exactly, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly here, but in the common vernacular, the way we normally use the word exactly, which is not as a scientist, but as in order to make a point. I knew exactly when these paintings were painted. And, and the answer is they were painted in the late 60s and early 70s. Isn't that weird? How did I know that? The answer is because I could tell. I could tell they were painted in the late 60s and early 70s. The main reason being they I could tell they were contemporaries of my professors, art professors in college, I could tell they, they painted at the same time. I was astounded the degree to which I could confidently, and, I, and to this day, I'm, I'm sure I'm right. Um, I was astounded the, the degree to which I could specify and nail down exactly uh, when these paintings were done. The reason, style, and the, the the one funny little thing. Now these were, you know, 
fine art paintings of moderately, slightly famous people in the late 50s and early 60s. It wasn't like, you know, Andrew Wyeth or, you know, ridiculously famous or just moderately famous people, like my, so to speak, like my professors. And uh, one funny little thing in particular is all the, the figures, they were impressionistic, some of them um, abstract expressionistic, but most of them were representational. And uh, one of the funny things is their feet, <laughs> the feet in the paintings, the, pe the, the people's feet. In fact, I can draw it for you. Let me find a piece of scrap paper over here. I, I can draw you exactly what, what their feet look like. I'm going to put a piece of paper on here. <laughs> so here's, here's how they painted the people's legs. And the feet looked like this. They were little triangles. <laughs> and there was a whole bunch of paintings by all different people in the room. I mean, that's what I mean by degree of specificity. It, I was astounded. I said, oh my goodness, I had two professors that painted feet exactly like that. Is that crazy? I think it's crazy. I think it's crazy that I could, that, that you could tell when they were painted. Uh, not just by the feet, but that was one. That was the most minor, tiny, specific thing about it. Um, okay, so the point being... Did, back in the 50s and 60s, were those artists, were they trying to paint like each other? I am convinced they were not. They, if you'd have told them at the time, if you'd have gone hold the mic microphone in front of them and said, um, do you realize that you're painting um, just like your peers? They would say harumph. <laughs> I've never heard anybody say harumph in my life, but you read it in books all the time. <laughs> I think that's what Harumph is supposed to represent. Humph. They would de they would deny emphatically that they were being influenced by they were painting out of their own personal uh, style, their own personal center as a being and as an artist. They would have been convinced. I'm sure that they would have con been convinced that they were they were painting with complete integrity. Are you with me? You see where this is going, though, don't you? They were not. They were being influenced by their peers and didn't even realize it. Whoa. That to me is like, a, what's the word? A morality tale. <laughs> that is like, whoa. Are you serious? You mean we can accidentally be painting like other people and not even realize it? And the answer is absolutely yes. So even though every once in a while I get thinking, man, maybe I should paint more like Kevin McPherson, you know? Um... And I like Kevin, believe me, I like Kevin McPherson stuff a lot. But uh, then I get thinking a little bit more deeply about it and go, uh, no. Okay, I keep painting weird. So my approach to painting is weird. You're welcome to be influenced by me. You can't copy me. I can't copy anybody else. You can be influenced by me. I get two, two things jump off on this painting. So I'm done down here, I think. Much more of that. It, it'd be too much. Uh, I'm not happy with the complete, this whole wall, and I'm not quite happy with the two salmon pink colored tanks. Um, I don't think they're quite bright enough. Okay, I want to tackle the, the, the wall of the uh, barn first, though. So let's get some Naples yellow. I find myself really liking Naples yellow a lot to mix with titanium white to achieve a warm white. Um, this, the gray that's here just looks a little muddy to me. However, there's one thing I don't want to have. See, if I'm brightening up this side, I don't suddenly want the entire barn wall to be the same value. So one of the things I liked about... Uh, whoops, whoops, sorry here. Sorry, there we go. Sorry about that. One of the things I liked about uh, the way that the barn has been is that it, it is. So what I think I'm going to do is that it's two tone. You know, it's light at top, dark on here. So I'm lightening this down here. But I think, come in. But I think that after I do this, I'm going to go back up to the top of the barn and um, lighten it. So come back with. Uh, 
right at the moment, I just I just put some pale blue into the paint down here. So just for variety. Yeah, I'm liking that. Yes, Lake. May I please have a paper for my picture? Yes, you may. Um, yeah, I think I'm liking this. I think I am. Uh, one of the things it's doing incidentally, accidentally, now is tying in with the blue that's up here in the sky. Okay, I'm gonna just wipe off this, these brushes. By the way, one, one of the reasons that it's a, a, good, a good idea to paint with two hands is that you can hold a different shape brush, say a different size and shape brush in each hand. And that automatically then creates uh, a variety of stroke. And right, the essence of good painting is making interesting marks. And the, the essence of interestingness, the most important aspect of interesting is variety. So simply by painting with two brushes at the same time, so to speak, you 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 buy yourself uh, some variety very very easily. You don't have to work; it just happens. And of course, what you see me doing right now is uh, universal. Um, we like to see light paint on top of dark paint. <laughs> and again, I know, you know, part of the interesting part about broadcasting every day is that I get interesting comments back. I enjoy your comments very much, uh, but it, 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 some people say things that I, I, have, wouldn't, I would never have dawned on me. So one of the comments I got was that this principle that I, that I propound all the time about light on top of dark, somebody suggested, no, that's only because uh, light paint because the light, uh, you know, to titanium dries more slowly. That's the only reason. Of course, that, that is preposterous. My, my adherence to this principle has absolutely nothing. I didn't learn it from some professor. I'm right in Nick's office. Um, I, uh, has nothing to do with speed dry, <laughs> speed of drying. <laughs> uh, somebody else might do this. Light on top of dark for that reason, but it's certain mine is purely visual. I assure you, my adherence to this reality is because of how it looks. Sorry, Shh, that's all right. You don't have to talk to me anymore. That's all right. Okay, um, okay, now, now uh, I've got too much contrast between the light part and the dark part. So that's easy to fix. I can come in here. Another way to say this is you can paint light on top of dark, so to speak, till the cows, cows come home. You can keep doing it as long as you want. You can do this principle. Of course, till it, everything just gets too light. If you have a canvas that's pure titanium white from one edge to the other, that would not be a very good painting. You know what I mean. Okay. Now it's starting to go somewhere. I'm wondering though, in here, I'm overdoing the, the lines a little bit too much. Too much the same. So I'm going to blend and then come back and scratch. Okay. Why? What I'm just doing right here. First of all, it looks like I undid them, then redid them. Indeed, that's what I did. Okay, so now we're back to another common principle that I propound all the time. Listen, here it is. Anytime that you are painting a repeated motif, that is the same object or shape over and over and over. So in this case, the repeat is the, the lines and the boards. 
right? Repeated over and over and over. Anytime you, you paint a highly re repeated po motif, you must, unless you want to break the rule, unless you want to do it wrong, you must come up with different methods for rendering that repetition. Okay? Many repeated lines. Most of these have been painted mostly, uh, as you've seen me do in the last few minutes, by negative painting. That is just I'm painting around, I'm painting the boards and leaving the, the gap uh, where it's dark, right? Um, hang on just a second. <laughs> I got my iTunes list playing. And somehow, you're, somehow in the past, I did something that made all the songs on my iTunes list uh, reduplicate, double. So instead of seven days of music on my iTunes, I have 14 days. But it's really because every song is on there twice. And I've tried to get all the Christmas music set off aside in a Christmas folder. But every once in a while, with 4,000 songs, one sneaks in. Okay. Um, let me try to give you another example. So, in the last few minutes, you've been seeing me. I've I've painted the repeated motif, but 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 the lines, two ways. One by painting negative painting, painting the boards and leaving the lines. Two by painting and then scratching. Now, just for fun, I'm going to do a third method, and that is where should I put this? by using a palette knife. Okay. So you get then a, a variety of marks, all indicating um, the, 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 the board, the lines between the boards. But you get variety. And of course, the variety, as you know, the most important aspect of, of interestingness is variety. And of course, variety of color, of course, variety of shape, variety of value, and so on. Okay, I think I'm pretty happy with that now. My, my S, and I'm just about, I'm 99.9% done with the, the painting. Um, tiny bit I want to do. This door looks like a little, a little overly ignored. So let me try to mix up a dull, dirty brown and uh, come in and just give a stroke here. to look like a, a dirty old barn door, right? Yeah, that'll work. Um, sorry, I'm seeing the, the door up here now that I'm focused. Um, this dark line right there on it is too dark. Just too dark. So let me mix up some light stuff and go up there. And overpaint that. Not the whole thing, as if I'm mad at it and I'm grumpy. And you may say, no, 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 no. Just the right degree. That's better. Now this board right here is a little too purple. Cover up part of it. Okay, I think that'll do. Um... Okay, one last thing I said I was concerned about, and that is, the, oh, two things, the color of the tanks here and the color of the grass. This band of green grass, let me expand you out a little bit, this band of green grass is a little too much the same all the way across. I've actually come in and broken it up with, with uh, color breaks, but they're, they're not quite, evidently, not quite strong enough because it's still reading 
as the same color. So here's how this kind of thing happens. It's exactly what it looks like. I mixed up a color of green and I put it on a couple of brushes and I kind of painted brum, all the way across to get the job done. And that's exactly what it looks like I did. It looks like I painted it all at once because I did. <laughs> and that's an unpleasant uh, look. Uh, it's not realistic. In reality, there'd be a, a wider range of colors than that in, in real life. So uh, I've got to mix up some other colors to come in here and break it up. And the, the colors that I'm doing have to be lighter, unless, unless I need some dark details, which I don't think I do, uh, in which case I could come in with some dark and then follow up. After doing the dark, follow up with more light. But I, I don't think that's needed. I don't think I need darkness. I think I just need color breaks. Okay, this area is a little better now. How about down here? Yeah. I'm going to um, make a browner shade of green. <laughs> How's that? Four. <laughs> Okay, I think I think that's all. Oh, that was better. There we go. There we go. Okay, last thing I think, last thing on this painting, last thing for the day, yeah, are those tanks. I just think they ought to be a little brighter. Now, let me give one other summary statement. This painting will be completely dry by tomorrow. And if I want to, and I often do, I have, if I have the opportunity to come back and do a painting the second day, um, I would do glazes, whatever colors I want, over the entire thing. And the painting, as it is, would instantly take on a, an, an, a glow, an aura, an atmosphere. And then so I would glaze it, then rag out areas, and then come in and do final details one more time. So uh, I might do that tomorrow. I just saw irritating little, um, irritating little uh, drawing issue that I need to fix. Hang, bear with me for a moment. This, there's a line right there that needs to be corrected. So I'm trying to mix up a neutral gray, neutral uh, warm gray. That's all. Maybe just a little too neat, a little too fastidious. I like that word. So it'll allow me to mess it up a little bit. There we go. That's better. Okay, finally, now let's talk about these pink tanks. I have a photograph. I printed out a photograph because I tweaked it, tweaked the image, tweaked the photo in Photoshop on my computer before I printed it out. And, you know, pushed the, the values and the colors here and there and here and there. But So that gives me a little bit of a, a something to go by. That color. And on that, now there's something I had noticed. The two tanks are different colors. Hmm. That would be good, wouldn't it? Well, I'm not going to go there right right immediately. I like I like that idea. So I want to mix up just a, a more intense red orange, Scarlet Lake, and some kind of orange. Not not a cadmium. I just try to avoid cads whenever I can. Yep. That starts with my name. Yep. Lake and Scarlet Lake. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, that's better already. Now let, let's move to the other one. I'm just going to um, mix up a pale or lighter version of what I just did. Earlier this afternoon, I was talking about how I liked the fact that I had little bits of this red up here in the sky, but in the course of finishing my the sky, I obliterated that. So now I'm cheating and just very in a very artificial manner, if you will, um, putting a few strokes of this red up in the clouds. <laughs> Yep, it's legal. Becca? Uh, yeah. May I please know this on the wall? Yes. Okay, good. They're two different colors now. A little hot spot of red right there. And this other tank is a red. I did a, sh I did a shadow on this tank earlier, and now I find myself not liking it. It's kind of a blue reflection. But nice idea. Doesn't work. So let me come back with a... Still a secondary lighting, but this light color. Good enough. You all have been champs and patient. Thank you for your time and attention. And I am... <laughs> I should be quitting. I should be stopping. One stroke too many. That one was okay. One stroke too many and you know what will happen. I'll be kicking myself. There, that was nice. That was nice. Is there any place else I can cheat and just squeeze in a bit of this? Orange color. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Over here. Because there's a hint of it already. I'm just taking that hint and exaggerating. Okay. Oh, I'm going to call that done. Let me expand here. And just take a minute to say thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. I look forward to reading your chat and reading the comments that uh, you guys leave later. I'll post a picture of this uh, on my YouTube and probably on my Facebook as well. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching.